when I was in the real estate team and I could actually go and see the building that we were we were working on and I could visualize it I really found that 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 helped me go through so we actually didn't realize that the built environment that we live in um, features on the news daily Hello everyone and welcome to the Student Lawyer podcast series. Whether you're at school, sixth form, university, thinking about a career in law or exploring law careers, you're in the right place. We are the one-stop shop for student lawyers. If you'd like to join the Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com. This episode is sponsored by the University of Law. The University of Law offers a range of undergraduate and postgraduate courses and master's degrees alongside an award-winning pro bono clinic so you can build up your legal experience while studying. And their experienced career service will enable you to put your best foot forward when launching your legal career. The courses are employment focused and based on real legal practice so you'll be better prepared for the workplace. Part-time and online study options Options are available so you can work and study at the same time. Click the link in the description box of the podcast to find out more about the courses on offer. Welcome to the Student Lawyer Podcast Series. My name's Camilla and I'm a trainee solicitor and I am the host for today's episode. We're delighted to be joined today on the podcast by Simon Robinson, who is a partner at Shakespeare Martineau. In this episode, Simon will be providing insight into life as a commercial property partner, explaining how trainees and juniors can excel in their careers, how the current economy conditions are affecting the commercial real estate market, and how Simon stays commercially aware, and much, much more. So make sure you stay tuned until the end of the episode. But without further ado, let's hand over to Simon. Simon, welcome to the Student Lawyer Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And for the listeners who don't know, um, I am actually training at Shakespeare Martineau and Simon is one of my supervisors. So it is a it is a very special episode uh, for me today, anyway, to have Simon on the show. So, yeah. Don't be nervous. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully none of this gets recorded on my uh, on my. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, please could you start by providing the listeners with an overview of your career history? Yeah, certainly. Um, I guess the first thing that I should, I should probably say is that I, I, I was relatively reluctant entrant into law. To be to be absolutely honest, I did a non-law degree, and was you know really wasn't set as potentially many of your listeners might be on on a, on a career in law in fact actually as, as my as my dad had 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 a career in law I guess I was very much riding against it and said I wouldn't do so um but I ended up moving that way and into law school etc afterwards um but um it wasn't necessarily a natural path through um so once I had done the the GDL, the conversion course at the time, and then the LPC, um, et cetera, I did end up with a training contract at a firm called SJ Bowen, um, which is sadly no longer with us, um, where I then subsequently qualified predominantly into planning uh, department, planning environment law, and spent three or four years there, three years there, I think it was. And actually then I went in-house and I acted as general counsel for what was uh, a London Stock Exchange fully listed investment uh, company. It st- still exists today, uh, albeit in a very different guise to, to to how I was when I was there. Uh, I was there for just under three years again um, before 2007 um, when we started to have a, a real hit in our property portfolio. So we, I, I helped run the property portfolio for the Investment Trust um and at that time in the property market it was uh turbulent at best and then catastrophic at times um and we we certainly suffered a little bit with that ultimately um were taken over and a part of that process i went and hunkered down back at uh private practice again in a firm called nabarro's but unfortunately didn't quite ride out the storm so had a 18 month patch just after that um 
without being in the law at all. Um, I did a bit of consultancy work at the time, but did completely different stuff uh, for, for nearly 18 months before then going back in um, and helping launch a London office of a small uh, regional law firm. Where again, I think about five years there before moving on to spend another three years in a sort of West End firm called Memory Crystal. Um, and then ultimately ending up at Shakespeare Martineau, where I am now. So quite a, a, a quite a track record, really. There, I mean, there are people I qualified with who are still at the same firms that they they started out with as trainees, or perhaps made one move. Um, I've been in private practice. I've been um, outside of the law completely, and I've also been in house. So, uh, and also actually a variety of different firms. So, S.J. Bowen was top twenty city law firm. Nabarro is very similar. Um, but ultimately, some one or two of the other firms are much smaller. Fascinating career history, Simon. Um, I think, yeah, it's so interesting that you've worked in so many different types of businesses and law firms, um, and especially the fact that you worked in an investment company really at such a monumental time that you were kind of really in the thick of it. So it sounds, yeah, it sounds like a really interesting career. You must have seen a lot, a lot of things. Um, yeah, I, I guess it was. It, it, it certainly um, working in the investment country. Interesting time is true. I mean, I look back now, um, and there's an awful lot that you learnt, and huge amounts of mistakes, um, and positives and negatives throughout all of it. Um, but you know, I think at the time it was quite quite nerve wracking, uh, seriously nerve wracking. But um, yeah, no, I think it, absolutely you can look back on all the various different steps and think, oh, yeah, learn something from that or that helped me move on there and hopefully don't make the same mistake again because our careers are going to be littered with them. It's just, it's the reality and um, it's how you how you learn from that, how you move forward from that, I think, which is really important. Absolutely. And there might not be a straightforward answer to this, but what kind of work does a commercial real estate lawyer typically get involved with? Well, you're right. Um, all I can do is answer what I do. Um, But ultimately, commercial real estate is a really large um, area of law. And, you know, if you go to some of the larger law firms, the commercial real estate department, Shakespeare Martin is included in this, will actually take the different work streams within uh, commercial real estate and split them up. And you'll find people, you know, specialising and narrowing their focus within real estate. Um, And you can really go quite narrow and really quite specialised within it. I have a bit more of a general practice. So um, from my world, I deal with pretty much every element of real estate um, from buying it, selling it, leasing it, uh, developing it. Um, obviously, the, the, I don't do the construction work. Uh, and I don't necessarily do the planning work either. That's dealt with by specialists in those fields. But my practice is very much focused around the client. Um, and I work predominantly for uh, real estate sort of entrepreneurs or investors um, and developers. So they will often identify bits of real estate, be it, be it commercial real estate or potentially residential real estate as well, or even bare land, and then look to uh, develop that land or potentially invest further in that land or you know, buy it, hold on to it, let it further, perhaps try and increase the rents on it and then sell it in the future. But using essentially commercial real estate as as an investment, as an asset. Um, but you know, as in that field, it covers an enormous amount of work. Things called landlord and tenant, which you, you know, everyone would have learned at their law school, etc. Um, the convincing processes that you require as well. Um, an awful lot of focus on planning process and planning policy in order to help guide uh, clients through the certainly when they come to development stages or potential development. Um, and then sort of overlaying all of that, um, we get involved a lot in financing because majority of commercial real estate transactions that we're involved in are leveraged, are geared uh, with, with lenders at some point and equally commercial uh, law as well. So do a lot of corporate um, so there's a lot of touching on corporate law. Again, corporate colleagues are the experts in this, but I need to have an understanding um, of the corporate world um, alongside it because these are all you know, we are nearly always using uh, vehicles in order to buy these. So these company vehicles. 
be they offshore, be they onshore, whatever it happens to be. But the the, the corporate side of my practice is is really important at the same time. Yeah, that's really interesting uh, range of work. And hopefully that will help the listeners because I know it's quite difficult when you're a student and before you join a law firm to know exactly what work uh, lawyers are, are doing. So, um, yeah, that's a really helpful insight. Thank you so much. And I mean, I'm sure I can help you answer this a little bit, but what are the what are some of the typical trainee tasks uh, that trainees do in a real estate seat? Okay. Um, well, as you say, you'll probably be able to, to help answer yeah. um, these days, whether it's any different. I mean, I think there is no typical uh, trainee tasks in, 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 in the seat because um, ultimately most trainees have six-month seats. It's generally what it is. And uh, so much depends on what is going on in that practice. Now, there are some practices I mentioned are relatively specialised within, within real estate. So um maybe block sales or, or something like that and, and there's relatively consistent work that they'll do throughout so there'll be relatively consistent processes etc within those fields so if you're training within that world you will probably have a relatively set um series of tasks that you will you will start doing that would be great but in in my practice in my world as you, you know you never really quite know um from month to month sometimes as to what I'm going to get necessarily through the door because I'm working my clients on whatever interests they happen to have. So ultimately, that means that the work that gets fed down um, to the trainees and they get involved in can vary dramatically. However, we do really try on the trainee side to introduce trainees to the uh, vagrancies and the difficulties potentially with land registration. They're dealing obviously with the land registry, with titles, which is the which is the base of so much of real estate law um and you'll certainly get involved in all in, in that there's also a huge we have a training program um that we try and fill the gaps in as best we can so that you have experience of leasehold land you have experience of freehold land um you have experience of landlord and tenant matters um hopefully setting up sales packs or being involved on a purchase where you might be reviewing a sales pack or at least helping to do that process We'd love to be able to take you through a financing as well so you can see the various steps that might be involved on, on real estate finance work as well. And you get exposure to the, the banking and the finance side at the same time. We would like to, well, we'd, I sort of hope that uh, there will be an element of project management that you can get involved with too, which I think is an incredibly important skill to learn. Um, the sort of organizational side of what we do is is vital um especially if we're dealing with matters that go across disciplines so we're bringing colleagues in as i say a bit from from the finance world from corporate or from planning or construction or sometimes there's you know we litigation aspects as well um so that project management aspect is really important um and whilst during your your training it, it is you're less likely to get it than perhaps the other elements. We would like to try and get as much client exposure as possible. Um, I'm not sure how you feel about this as a, as a current trainee, but I know that sort of pre the Zoom and the Teams um, generations that we're, we're sort of now in as a trainee myself, you know, I, I was lucky enough to get the experience to go to client meetings, to go in and sort of really um i mean i was a spare part to, 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 to much of a degree or ultimately um my job was to stick the uh, sign here stickers on the various documents that you had and to ensure that everyone was signing and witnessing correctly etc but in those sort of larger completion completion meetings there were you know really really good experience and i'm very mindful actually that that side of of training contracts is, is really disappearing um, I mean, we're barely sometimes in the room now when clients sign if they're docu signing, etc. Yeah, that's it. My experience. I mean, I can sort of attest to everything that you've said. I've definitely had a good. Um, I've definitely been involved in a lot of project management and uh, dealing with the land registry and and. But like you said, the the it is like client meetings don't seem to be happening in the same way as perhaps they did before. And a, a lot of people seem to be using DocuSign these days. So that's been my personal experience with, with the signing process. Um, but I, I understand it's still paper signatures are still around. 
and probably will yeah. be for a while. So yeah, they do. I think I think you know it's true. The the I will try and maintain as much client contact now as I always have done, but ultimately I'm quite aware that actually that probably doesn't filter down throughout the team um, quite as much. Um, you know, client contact is still predominantly held within sort of the partner or the or the team leader uh, often or the client or the client leader for, uh, in reality, but. Um, it's something we will always try to do. I think every everyone needs to, needs to have that. Your practice as you grow, your training seat is meant to be that. It's meant to be exposure to the, uh, the the discipline that you're currently working in, and an understanding of what your life or your profession would be. Certainly for the first few years within that discipline, uh, within that seat. And there's no way within the six months that you can cover everything. Um, and I think it's actually something that's really important for everyone to notice is that you know with law is a for good or for better or for worse is a relatively uh stepped process and i said you know the traineeship is an incredibly important step but it is a step um and i think throughout our careers we have to just recognize that we are moving up those steps as best we can you know becoming qualified is certainly the culmination and the end of one process but it very much is the beginning <laughs> of another process and I think if you talk to the in, in our team that you know well, if you talk to the um, the solicitors and the associates in our team, they'll tell you that you know it's a big thing qualifying. It's, it's a wonderful thing to have to got to that step, but you you very much have to have your learning head on all the way through um, because there's a huge amount of stuff that we do. And there's no way you can get um, full understanding of that in one six month training seat, and there's no way, in fact, for you know three four years and and plus um, as you go through your career. I'm doing you know learning things now yeah 20 years on. I think that's really comforting to know that after six months we aren't expected to know everything so that's great no no I mean you really it really won't I mean I'm hopefully gone of the days when trainees really after the end of their six month seat um really only knew the workings of a photocopier and because that was you know at times I'm sure that was the case um I remember litigation seat uh uh, I, I understood what was a pagination machine back then, and you know, I did vast amounts of that. Never really felt, and maybe that's why I didn't move into litigation. But just my seat was such that I never really felt I got to grips with what was going on at all. Um, so hopefully those days have gone, and we're really going to involve trainees in everything that we do. There will be some administrative tasks. It, it is the nature of it, but ultimately some of those administrative tasks are actually lie at the bedrock of what we then do and we leave a job later on so we need to understand how those things work the land registry um being being very much part of that definitely so if we have some listeners um who are tuning in who are really keen to explore or maybe they already have their heart set on a career as a real estate lawyer what skills do you think that they should develop which will put them in a good position to excel in their careers in real estate well, obviously, um, the you know, what you learn uh, a, a bit part of a law degree or on the um, the conversion course and into your LPC, make sure that you do tick the boxes next to the land law. Um, I mean, it's quite clear that I think what's quite interesting is having worked with paralegals um, prior to their LPCs and then they go and do an LPC and they came back and actually trained and qualified with me. Um, I always remember particularly one one person sort of saying, well, I went and did my LPC and I was very excited because I thought I'd understand the, uh, I'd go really into the landlord section of it, the conveyancing section of it. And he said, it was nothing like what we did, Simon, nothing like it at all. Um, but you learn the correct process there, um, you know, in a theoretical world. But of course, in the real world, you have to accept that it's go- it could be quite different to the theoretical world that you learn in the LPC. You need to understand that. You need to understand what would likely happen. But ultimately, when we when, when we sit down each day, um, the commercial world and the uh, realistic of the real world to a certain degree may well be different. Um, I think if you really are keen on the real estate is your, is your career then start to i think just go you know, prick your ears up and listen to what's going on in the market i'm um, real estate with I, I i ended up in real estate because it was a there was a physical element to it that i could see and touch 
So when we build stuff or when we buy stuff or we sell stuff, ultimately it probably exists. So um, for a while I thought I was going to be some international corporate financier and I really couldn't get my head around some of the the concepts that just really uh, were on paper. Um, Whereas when I was in the real estate team and I could actually go and see the building that we we were working on and I could visualize it, I really found that 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 helped me go through. So we actually then realized that the built environment that we live in um, features on the news daily, I mean, all the time. I mean, right now, some of the things that could be highlighted that are in the news all the time is the the the, the housing crisis and the, the lack of new housing that we've got, the difficulty for people to get on the ladder, the interest rate changes that we've noticed in inflation is affecting mortgages, which is affecting the housing market. And that is, you know, it's front page news. Um, So to my mind, you don't actually have to look or try very hard to start getting yourselves abreast of things that are going on. And and whilst it may not directly talk about commercial real estate, the factors that affect perhaps the housing market, because that's what about the residential market but those 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 factors to a certain degree also affect the commercial um market and then you you know we hear about the great rise in e-commerce and um yeah amazon obviously but also the fact that we are having most of our produce delivered to our door and just follow that train of thought back that means that there's got to be distribution that means there's got to be warehouses and you look back in real estate trends over the last 10 years and the you'll see when you drive on the motorway the amount of large distribution warehouses that have been built up so as i say you're just driving along and you can see the real estate world happening um in front of your eyes you can just notice oh my god that wasn't there when i was here two years ago i'm driving down this m the m1 and suddenly these enormous um multi-loading bay large storage warehouses and distribution warehouses are, are, are appearing and then you walk down your high street and you see what's happening there everyone reads about the sort of demise of the high street to a certain degree but you can see it it's, you know shops are potentially closed down or they're being replaced or you you see the brands and the retailers that are replacing older more established brands perhaps and the type of shopping experience that you're getting is changing and all of that is the real estate market which we we work in yeah i think that's um definitely resonates with me since i've started in a real estate seat when i drive around and see developments i just start to think in a more technical way about what actually might be going on um behind the scenes just from yeah the experience that i've had yeah. so i can definitely agree with the the tangible aspect being very interesting and in your experience, what do clients in the commercial real estate sector value most in their lawyers? And what tips do you have for standing out, winning repeat business and building a client base without obviously giving away all your secrets? <laughs> well, not many, many secrets. And I think probably that's a question for my clients, not for me. Um, oh, uh, there are many, many courses and um trainers out there who talk about networking building client bases and they will have all manner and be far better qualified than i to list the various things um i don't think i have any secrets to that and throughout my career i've had moments where I felt I've really had a, a maybe a good pitch for something or a really good chat with somebody and we've parted to say definitely we're going to do working together and it's gone really positively. And then a few months down the line, I'm thinking nothing's come of that. You know, I've not, you know, I've, I've keep trying and, and nothing's happened. And then sometimes I've had a conversation with someone relatively um, a short conversation, but be a good conversation, but it's obviously just at the right moment or the right time. And a piece of work that they had came about, and I, I, I was who they thought of, or, or, or we were talking about it at the time, and and it, and it arrived. So there is no hard and fast rules, I don't think. I think one of the most interesting things, and again, go back to this post-COVID world that we live in, where, um, is talking and listening to people. Um, and yes, we can do this on screen, and and that's fine, but ultimately my personal view is that people do business with people and if someone is instructing you their uh the proposal is that they they pay you um they pay the firm for for your services and i think it's a 
common human trait that before we part with money, we really want to try and understand what it is that we're paying for. Um, and I think in our world, an awful lot of that is meeting and, and, and understanding and a handle of who you're going to be dealing with. And so that's one of the biggest, biggest things for me is really meeting with clients, trying understanding what they want, listening to them, and then being honest and being valid, um, and then following through with those promises. Uh, as in many things, if you if you promise stuff that you can't achieve, you're going to get found out. Um, and uh, what I, I, I work in is one, I'm not looking for singular pieces of businesses. I'm looking to work with people and then continue working with them um, to build up long-term relationships as best I can. And for them to feel confident that they can pick up the phone to me, regardless of what's going on, whether it's real estate law or not. Um, and I wasn't, I won't necessarily be able to answer that query. We might be able to have a think through potential solutions or ways of finding out the answer, who may be else to speak to. And and you only get that by being, by being genuine, honest, delivering on your promises and not over promising. Um, I think that's really important. The other thing that, I've certainly been really slow to pick up on the value. It's taken me time. I'm starting to realize a bit more is uh, to, under, to understand your worth. I know what what is it you bring to it, and and don't be afraid to ask for payment for that. Don't be afraid to say to your clients, "Yeah, this is what I can bring. This is what I can do." I'm sure that you know you want that if they do, <laughs> and if they do want it, then. You'd sit down and discuss, well, that's the case, but you know, this is my experience and this is what we want to bring to the table. That to a certain degree is part of the commercial commercial deal. And again, that's that's being honest and upfront. So uh, that's not a good answer, really, is it? But it's a no, best I think it was a brilliant answer. The the theme that ran throughout the answer was communication, essentially. And I think that, you know, you started off by sort of saying that sometimes it can be just a matter of being in the right place at the right time but to be in the right place at the right time you need to have built those relationships which comes down to communication and then you have to actually be listening to your client to find out what they want and what they want help with so that you can be the solution which is in the right place at the right time yeah so yeah i think i think that's um i think i think uh i think to, to slightly to add to it of course is the one other important thing is to remember that well, you know, winning clients is what the people say it, but you know, obtaining is is only step one. Again, I go back to the set process. It's only only step one because you may have had the greatest pitch ever, you may have the greatest conversation, you may have met the right person, and you just click, and it's like, yes, we can work together. This is perfect. This is going to work go well. But if ultimately your service that you then subsequently provide doesn't fit, doesn't work, isn't isn't the right thing for, either for that client or or, or it's just not up to scratch. Um, then everything that's gone before is is gone. You know, you won't get that second piece of work. Or even more importantly, possibly, they won't, when they're talking to someone else, recommend you. Yeah. Because the clients all, you know, they're often doing business with each other and um, they've often got contacts in the business, they're networking themselves. And, you know, if you're doing a good job, then ho- hopefully your clients will stop talking well of you and and I have got jobs that way I have had people just phone up and say hi so and so just speaking to them and they recommended you and I've got this problem right now and what can I do about it or I'm looking at this what can I do about it and that does happen and word of mouth I mean there's nothing better than being recommended by your own clients I mean that really is that's the pinnacle that's the ultimate compliment I'm sure I'd like to take a moment to speak about the University of Law, which is the university I decided to study my LPC at. The University of Law is the sponsor of this podcast and makes it possible for us to continue bringing these episodes to you. So we really appreciate you supporting us by supporting our sponsors. What really sets the University of Law apart from other universities is its belief in training students for the real world from the moment they accept a place. The University of Law's experienced career 
career service and award-winning pro bono clinics offer students the chance to get real-life legal experience which can boost employability. They offer a range of undergraduate and postgraduate legal training and master's degrees designed by qualified experts to help students excel at any stage of their career. Their courses are employment focused, honing key skills in a teaching environment based on real legal practice. Part-time and online study options are also available on many of their courses to help students work and study at the same time. If you'd like to find out more about the courses on offer, please click the link in the description box of the podcast. I wonder if you could talk to us about one of your most memorable matters, um, if you're able to, without obviously revealing too much information. Um, perhaps going into what the key issues were and, and what the outcome was and, and why it was memorable to you. That's really, I mean, tricky. So I say it's tricky because actually, despite having been a relatively reluctant entrant into law, we've had several memorable matters for, for completely different reasons. Um, some of them, you know, I, I had a, a remarkable experience many years ago uh, where... I'm not entirely sure quite how the lead came to me, but um, it ended up, it was completely cold lead. And I ended up meeting a gentleman who walked into my office at the time, um, carrying a Tesco's carrier bag full of loose papers. Um, and even though he will, he will, he will not mind me saying he wasn't the, be- the best address. He wasn't an obvious businessman and so on. And we sat down and I started talking to him and um, off the back of that, I ended up um, representing four retail unit owners who were uh, uh, their building as essentially was going, well, a developer was trying to buy their building and then they were going to knock everything down and then build um, a new 140 unit, I think it was 120 unit residential block with um, retail and offices down below, a mixed use residential block. And these guys were crucial to this deal happening. And it turns out that this, this business owner actually uh, owned an awful lot of uh, laundrettes uh, or, or, and dry cleaning establishments all across London. He was an, actually a remarkably wealthy man, but just not very well organised <laughs> and um, carried his papers in, in, in plastic bags. And off the back of that, I started acting for him on various uh, projects. But on top of that, the other personnel that he worked for um it was just a really good personal project because we were able to secure surrender of their units to really good deal to get new units put back in again and we had um i really enjoyed dealing with the individuals because they knew they had a really good opportunity here but they didn't know how to to make it work and it was just memorable because of how it started um it was just not a start that i expected and and some I think overall that project took nearly three years all told and out of the four clients there one actually retired off the back of the deal but um the other three i then acted for for some of their business interests completely separately for the next few years afterwards so that's really sort of interesting story the other one that i'd probably mention being more recent and sort of on the totally different scale was a development site in kensington um uh, a historic building, grade two star listed, which we purchased for um, investors uh, who are then looking to develop the property um, by way of a sort of a comprehensive type refurbishment, but different because of the value of it, tens of millions of pounds, the value of the uh, residential development that we're going to bring out of it, and the fact that during the process of buying it, because of the ownership and the way it was set out uh, and funding arrangements. At one point, I think I counted seven different sets of lawyers involved in the deal. Um, Ultimately, the land, the freehold is owned by the Crown Estate, so they were involved as well. Um, We had teams of planning consultants understanding what we can and can't do at the site. There was some really interesting um, peculiarities and specific elements to the building itself, so we need heritage consultants etc and as i say we were dealing with lawyers based in many different jurisdictions ultimately the funding although was a, a very much a recognized bank but they were using uh one they were actually funding via 
one of their uh, banking subsidiaries again um, in Europe. So I remember sitting at my desk thinking, "This is this is this is a remarkable deal," just simply because of the stretch of uh, or the, the spread, sorry, of jurisdictions uh, and legislations, the number of lawyers involved, and I very much felt like this sort of conductor in the middle of it because as buyers we were trying to we were leading and driving the process as best we can um and myself and client colleague as in uh the client the two of us really would be sort of sitting there in the middle really trying to conduct everything and uh we, we achieved it it took a long time it took a really long time it was really hard work and particularly stressful um but we were able to bring all elements internally together which was great the client got what they wanted which was fantastic um but we had to ride out a lot of bumps along the way and i think the achievement of having having got there um it fell down twice during the process as well for whatever reason very different reasons and it, it, it and we had to then try and resurrect it and bring it back together so the problem solving aspects the cross jurisdictional aspects the cross discipline aspects the sensitive location the actual sensitive um property itself but also i really believe in the ultimate vision of what the client's going to do as well and the product they're going to create so yeah bringing all those in one deal was was brilliant really good yeah it sounds great to work on something really complex and you know having all those ups and downs but then when it all falls into place at the end and you get a good outcome for the client it must be really really satisfying mm. And we've spoken a little bit already about the economic conditions in the UK, in the world at the moment. Um, you know, we've got sky high inflation, a rise in interest rates and a looming recession. And that's putting pressure on a lot of businesses and individuals. How is this translating to the London commercial real estate market? And what do you think the main opportunities and challenges are for clients and lawyers at the moment? Oh, it's a really pertinent question. Commercial real estate is heavily geared, so it, it is reliant a lot on on lending. And lenders are very happy to lend. It's a, it's a market they very much want to be involved in. And the British um, real estate market has historically always been so. Um, so any shifts in interest rates or bank behaviour lender behavior will have an effect um and as a result really the commercial real estate market is, is very cyclical it's well known for peaks and troughs um we talked earlier about the the the, the sort of infamous 2007 2008 to 2009 difficulties over that time but it's well worth remarking that after that 2010 onwards saw um rise in property prices and yields and investment income and so on uh way beyond what was there before so we had this enormous um downturn and then for many years afterwards the the, the upturn was, was 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 pretty historic as well so um we have a market that does that and we are in a market right now which is is suffering um, it's un undoubtedly going to be suffering, as in there are just not as many transactions taking place as there was. With real estate law as a whole, there will all, you know, as long as there are transactions to a certain degree, there's always going to be work for us, which is great. Um, but um, ultimately, we always want positive markets. And uh, the slightly negative market that we're having at the moment is, is quite tricky. That said, there are many out there that see this sort of market as a huge opportunity. Certainly, if you are less reliant upon the lending market, and the lending market at the moment is just higher interest rates, and, and it's just more expensive to borrow money, which means the profit margins on on uh, projects is, is not what it was, which is less attractive to investors and leads to a softening. But if you are able to essentially bring more cash cash is king if you can bring more cash uh, to a project then potentially with softening markets you might see more um attractive pricing uh or you might see opportunities that aren't there in growth markets um as well 
sometimes for some investors that I work for, um, when the market uh, does soften, as it is right now, um, they have perhaps more of an opportunity to come to the table. Perhaps when in the large markets, when you have large investment funds or even pension funds or whatever, they're often at the front of the queue uh, for good assets to, to purchase investment assets or whatever. Um, and if they're less interested at the moment, perhaps they're thinking about other things, then some of the smaller players, who you know, the smaller medium operators who I tend to act for have uh, potential greater exposure and greater opportunity. They also can often be a bit more flexible, a bit more agile. Um, they don't they don't have the large corporate setups that some people have. Sometimes we act for a sort of few uh, family offices or um, smaller setups, certainly on the developer and the investment side. And again, they can they can just look at opportunities and jump on them a little bit more. So uh, right now, I think we're very much uh, in a, a phase where we went through the winter, um, and obviously we know about all the difficulties. From September to October onwards, with interest rates, etc. As we've had a new year, um, there's definitely people have come back in to the new year with a view to to trying to 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 generate business and to work on it. Um, not quite seeing the results just yet, so not seeing an awful lot of deals just yet happening. But I think there is more positivity already. Um, so I'm hoping that this is a relatively small. Um, soften and the market will start to, to pick back up again but I'm sure it'll be cautious for a while and uh, you know for us there's a lot of commercial real estate lawyers out there so it does mean the competition is probably a bit more intense for for slightly less work so I hope that the client relationships we've built up over 15 20 years um, stay strong and we can we can help them whenever they've got a project on on their mind. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive insight it's yeah it's really interesting to know how the economy is affecting the real estate market and i'm sure that like you said there are opportunities to um to take take advantage of at the moment um in in some areas so that's good news and like you said i should add actually just thinking about that as well i mean one of the other things that is really important it it links back to something we said earlier um you know those housing developers etc you know just think about that at the moment it's very clear that people are having much more difficulty in getting affordable mortgages right now um without those affordable mortgages then the housing developers don't have a market to sell their product to um but at the same time on a sort of macro scale we know that we are woefully low on our house building targets so uh outside the interest is having a thing but there's a lot the interest rates are having their effect but outside that there's larger political and economic effects as well um so the, the removal recently of the housing targets by the government is is a, a major concern obviously for the real estate sector because we build them and so on but actually wider concern as well because if we don't have those housing targets the incentives won't be there to build on me to build the houses but we still need the houses <laughs> so um you know we're not going to there is going to be a real problem in delivering what is needed thing so I do think that that is a slightly separate issue, but also something right here and now in our market that's incredibly, uh, incredibly important. And um, the planning process and the housing um, targets are something that we're really doing and looking at. And I know there's the, the, there's so much speak um, a bit on sort of LinkedIn and and, and, and various social media, but equally seminars and amongst clients about those macroeconomic matters as well as the um the interest rate we was very aware of at the moment inflation and what is your favorite way to stay commercially aware um bit of a buzzword there but <laughs> <laughs> to stay commercially aware and up to date with the key financial and political news that's affecting your clients and um, are there any resources that you would recommend to our listeners so if we're talking real estate per se um as I say, just keep your eyes open as you travel around. You know, look out the train window and look what's going on. You can see what's being built. You can see the market. You know, it's it's there in real estate, and you can see it just as you, um, you know, engage in everyday life. As I say, walking down the high street or or whatever. So, I mean, you become commercially aware by by seeing those things. Um, and we talked about, as I say, if you look or you listen carefully on the news, you will see. The real estate market even if it's not directly referred to it's it's there um it, it's often got top billing as well 
in in the news today. Um, as far as sort of resources, again, I am not a great contributor to, and was relatively slow as the party probably to LinkedIn and things like that. But ultimately, there is an enormous amount of content now uh, on on those. And um, you know, be careful as ever with these things. Um, there's no control over the publishing of of what gets published, but um, you know, there are many re- really reputable um, providers of content out there, certain individuals who give incredibly good uh, commentary on various markets. Um, and it's certainly, I, I tell you, it's really interesting. The legal planning um, commentary that's on LinkedIn uh, is, is is exceptional. Um, that, 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 whatever the reasons the lawyers in those in in that in that market, but there's some really really interesting. Um, stuff out on LinkedIn. So it's definitely worth checking that through. Uh, but ultimately, I wouldn't just rely on that. Um, there are two or three well but known publications within UK real estate market. Uh, Property Week, the Estates Gazette in particular, um, are two uh, publications. They are cross the market. So they're not legal publications. Um, they're very much more so what our clients would be looking at and reading. Um, and then there are sort of within real estate, there are some very sector specific uh, publications that also look at the market. So if you're if you're dealing as we occasionally do in in prime or super prime residential development, um, there is a there are specific uh, prime residential magazines, um, predominantly online magazines on, but that that the, the deal with that market. There are logistics, there are retail, um, all sorts of uh, various. I think there's still going. There's a, a a magazine called The Grocer, which was very much dealing with retail and obviously dealing with food retail, which in itself is a whole another sector with enormous players, you know, the Tesco's, the Waitrose, the, the Sainsbury's of this world. Um, so there's there's an awful lot. But Property Week and Estates Gazette do span real estate, commercial real estate as a whole. So that would be a really good place. And I think as a student, don't expect to understand everything that's being talked about in there at all just work your way through read it and just keep picking it up regularly because i think that's what you said is really important to understand what's going on um picking up one week and then not looking again for two or three months down the line isn't really going to show you how the market might be progressing whereas if you just keep picking up regularly um uh, and work your way through it i'm sure i'm certainly <laughs> i don't know now but when i was at uh study at law school uh there were high, there were paper copies of both of those available in the libraries and i i I have to confess, I've not been back to a law school or a university environment for a while, and I presume paper copies are no longer there, but most of them I would have thought might have subscriptions, and you'd be able to access it. Um, a Status Gazette actually has, a, I think it's a daily podcast. I've listened to a few of them, and they are really good. So I would definitely check that out if yeah. you prefer to listen to things. Um, I don't know. I've never read the actual publication, so I don't know whether it's subscription or free. But Yeah, they, they both have um, daily update emails as well. Okay, that's really good. They send out with a little pricey. Uh, I think I have to have a subscription to then delve deeper into the actual particular article. Um, EGI is the Estates Gazette's online uh, intro, uh, to which I know you can certainly sign up for as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, ultimately, they're fantastic um, overview. And I'd like to talk a bit about partnership now, um, because as the listeners will know, um, you are a partner at Shakespeare Martino. And I'd really like to know what it actually takes to make a partner. And when should associates start thinking about partnership if that is their goal? Uh, Let's answer the second question. I think um, a career in law can lead to many different places. I look back at the law school um, friends that I have, and um, it's very interesting, actually. Uh, you know, historically, people would enter law law firms and then rise and become a partner. The the breadth uh, of different experiences amongst those that certainly that I went to law school with is is incredible. Um, you know, several are outside of law now, moved on to something else, completely different. Um, some are sort of semi-academic law. Um, some see their careers have gone to PSL, so professional support lawyer functions within law firms. 
um, a lot have gone in-house as well and some really different projects that they're working on or different companies that they work for. Um, so, and then some have risen and become partners. Um, in fact, one or two of them um, are still at, at, at law firms and I'm sure would could, and could be partners, but actually have chosen not to become uh, a partner and, and chosen to stay out of the actual partnership. So I think whilst most people would enter, perhaps enter the, uh, a law firm thinking, yep, I'm partners the way where you end up to, I'd really keep an open mind as to whether that's the right path for you. I really, really would. So um, you sort of start thinking about it from day one, but ultimately you know, you're not reaching partnership is unlikely to be something, certainly within the commercial and transactional sphere that, that I operate in, it's, it's going to be unlikely something that you're going to get to much before sort of eight or 10 years PQE these days. Um, and that's no slight on your ability or, or anything like that. It is just ultimately, as I talked about the steps before, you know, it's such a huge, um, law is such an enormous beast. It's an enormous subject. And even commercial real estate law is an enormous subject. You you know, reaching partner does not mean by any stretch of imagination you're over on, on top of it all at all. But um, you do need to have a, a good understanding of, of of the legal profession in your chosen sphere before you can reach the partnership level, predominantly because of the supervision responsibilities that you will have, um, the fact that taking that tag what that means in the market and what that means it shows the level of competency experience etc and, and it's a, a, a law is an experiential subject um we we study it certainly but really we only learn it on the job and um you know it takes many years to just to plow through and you just got to do those steps and i have these chats with junior lawyers quite a lot where i say you, they're doing brilliantly and we just got to keep doing brilliantly. Um, it's not a case of not doing well enough to to move. Um, absolutely, we'll keep moving um, up the ladder to get there. But you know, for the first few years, you may have only been exposed to certain types, and we need to bring other assets of 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 the of the discipline in to 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 get up to partnership. As to what it takes to make partner, I think it really really differs uh, depending on where you are. Not only the discipline you're in, the firm you're in. Um, I'm sure that what it takes to make partner at a high street, as we refer to them as a sort of um, more of a family practice, will be different to what it takes at a commercial city based law practice. What I think I, well, in, in, in my, my experience, it was twofold. It was showing uh, the ability and having a client following. So the ability to win clients, maintain them, hold on to them the ability to work with existing clients and show that technical expertise, um, perhaps even take existing clients of the firm, but then grow them. So you're able to talk to those clients about perhaps taking on more work and taking a relatively small client in the firm and then hopefully build them to a larger client for the firm, be it across discipline or, or whatever. And then really importantly, um, being able to work with bring on supervise educate juniors within the law firm because ultimately the the law firm the partnership as a beast will survive by having really good high quality solicitors and associates come through and whilst they themselves have the all the ability to be good solicitors and partners in the future ultimately how they're supervised and how they learn and how they're introduced to work and for them to feel they can ask questions and to learn from those um, who lead the teams, which are predominantly the partners, is just so important. Um, just so important. And I think you can see that. You can see in law firms perhaps where uh, a trainee or even a, a junior may be working with someone, it's just not clicking. It's just not working with their supervisor. I think. And then they move to another seat or perhaps they just internally, they just start working with a different partner and uh, it clicks and it works and then they just progress massively and that's to say not the first partner wasn't good it just perhaps wasn't the right the right click so as i say i think it really varies from, from where you happen to be and and ultimately i think again in, in a career in law 
as I say, there are those who have gone all the way through. Um, friends of mine have stayed from Weatherby trainees and they've found the right spot and it's worked brilliantly for them. Some of them, myself included, it, it took some time to to find out where they where they fitted best, um, be that personnel or just the attitude of the firm or the focus of the firm. Um, so you know, don't be afraid to um, to to keep looking. Yeah, and and it, this kind of reminds me of uh, something that a previous guest that we had on the show said, um, Heather Townsend. She she explained she coaches professionals about you know how to actually reach partnership in law firms and other professional services firms, and she said, and this is something that I didn't really necessarily think of, but. She said that it's not the case that you become a solicitor, an associate, partner. It's not necessarily that um, that's not how the line of progression necessarily works because partner is a very different job. It's not just a promotion from an associate. It's completely different. So you actually need to think about whether your skill set and whether your uh, where your interests lie because you might not actually enjoy the role of a partner. It is very different from an associate so I thought that was really interesting and kind of echoes what what you said today as well yeah I think that's I think that's absolutely true and I think equally the other thing to me is especially when you've got larger partnerships um the role of each partner within that partnership also differs too um you know hugely um you have some partners um and it's becoming more so actually as as, as partnerships become perhaps a little bit more multidisciplinary so we start to we, law firms are starting to bring personnel from a management perspective and financial perspective of of the firm into the partnership as well and historically that wasn't that wasn't the way it worked at all um it was simply you know lawyers who were partners but actually that that, that's not necessarily the case but as the lawyers themselves promote to in, in the partnerships and that's why i say perhaps each partnership you need to look at each one and 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 learn whether it's the right one for you they may want different things out of their partners or just your 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 specific role. So my role as a partner now within Shakespeare Martino is different to several of my other partners. Um, quite different. What, what I, you know, and, and as I say, it just it may be that that isn't that isn't the natural path for you. Um, you may well end up doing something else outside of outside of the law, or perhaps outside of private practice in house. Or I mean, I've also seen you know have 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 got ex-colleagues who've gone into um well, essentially teaching working for the university of law or for bpp or, or something like that and have you know now running either lpc courses or they're working through in fact actually another one who 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 works at the practical law company plc who is a precedent database and and knowledge management and so on and they provide an awful lot of the content that's on there so there's a, a huge variety of places that you can you can take it partnership is just one of them thank you and this brings us to our final question today if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a student or trainee what would that be so it'd be slightly different for being a student to being a trainee if i go back to a student i think and the one piece of advice i hope to pass on is if you're lucky enough to have the choice because not everyone does, but if you are lucky enough to have the choice to try and do something that you enjoy, sometimes just forget whether it's what you feel professionally you should do or whether it's financially the right thing and so on. Do something that you you really enjoy, because if you enjoy it, and and it's a horrible, it's a buzzword that I don't really like using and you have a passion for it. I, I don't like that as a concept because I think it's very difficult to sit there and really valid, validly say that I've got a real passion for this because everything that you do, there's negative aspects and there's positive aspects. There's things you enjoy about things you don't enjoy about it. Um, but ultimately, if you really enjoy doing something, you're likely to succeed and do well at it. But people will also see that in you. And then you will do well. Now, where that takes you, I don't know. But as a student, I think one of the things I think would be I really wanted to sit down, everyone, when I was there anyway, was very much sitting down saying, right, now you've done your student bit. Now now let's look at the professional. Let's look, let's look at where you're going to take your, your life professionally. And I think ultimately, what I never got asked and I never asked myself is, um, what do I enjoy? Let's say what I want to be. What do I enjoy? What do I really enjoy? Because I, who knows where that path will take me. But if I, if I enjoy it, I'm I'm going to go out of my way to to do it well. I think, and I think that sets you in a great stead. 
And then I think as a trainee, um, I think the piece of advice that I would I, I would give a trainee is to listen, always keep your ears open, always keep your eyes open, and always open to possibilities. Um, I think by telling a slightly uh, a story that, that really underpins how I got in and started doing commercial real estate. I talked earlier about the fact that I could see it and, and feel it, but also that when I started my career, I had these complete delusions of grandeur that I was going to be a some sort of international corporate finance lawyer or financier or something. I, I felt that's what I would do. Um, really, look back now, it really doesn't fit me at all, but for some reason I thought that was a thing. Um, I think on my third, second or third day in the office as a trainee was September the 11th. So obviously work com- completely stopped and I, I say work I really didn't know what I was doing at the time and I was just I think and as a, a at the firm we were just looking aghast at the horrors um on the screens that we could see and my first seat because I boldly shared but was corporate finance international corporate finance and obviously the second that happened um quite understandably and everything that world completely stopped and so for uh, a few weeks afterwards, I was very much sat as a trainee and amongst associates uh, at the law firm with very little to do. And we really didn't have very much work whatsoever. And everyone was just scratching around a little bit. I wasn't really getting much training at all because there just wasn't in that seat much to do. And uh, essentially was told, really, as much as anything else, although I, I did have some sort of choice, that I needed to go and work in the planning department as a trainee there. So I ended up going over to the planning department, not something I'd ever really envisaged that was going to do. I wasn't one of the trainee seats I identified or anything or anything like that. I ended up running uh, a really significant planning appeal um, with a very senior, well-respected, extremely senior, well-respected uh, planning partner who actually received an OBE for her services uh, later down the line. Uh, not an easy uh, time, in fact, a really, really difficult time because um, living, actually, living, living off site because um, the planning appeal was held um, in the town where 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 we were appealing against the, the planning decision. So I'd spend my weeks living in a hotel there, working through the planning appeal. It was for over six weeks, um, but I had a remarkable experience. It was really tough, but I was dealing with QCs as they were then at the time. And junior barristers, a whole wreath of experts, um, because it's a particular project to do waste management. But we also even had PR advisors. And due to the nature of the workload that, that she had on at the time, I my exposure was well beyond what most trainees get. And oh good lord, it was a massive shock. But um, as I say, keep your eyes and ears open because ultimately. That led to being offered a role as a newly qualified in planning, and it completely changed my outlook about what I was going to do as a as a lawyer. Um, and, and moving into the real estate world completely changed it. And so, without sort of saying yes to that opportunity, never. I don't know where I would what I would be doing now. I'm not sure where it would happen. There'd be another path, I'm sure. But as a training, I think just uh, yeah, don't dismiss these things. You never know what's going to end up. Yeah, I think. Um... Not myself, but I'm sure that other people, if they didn't get the seat that they wanted, they would maybe, you know, not necessarily engage or or not be not throw themselves into it as much as they might do for a seat that they really, really want to do. Um, but I think that just goes to show the importance of having an open mind and just giving it all to all of the seats that you do, even if it's not something that you necessarily think you will enjoy mm. because you never know what will happen and what you might end up loving it's a really difficult it is a really difficult um thing when you don't get the seat that you don't that, that you want um and that's tough and i think um i think it's really important that if you do feel that you know where you're going and there are people that join law and they know what they want to do and i hope they've chosen their law firms and managed to get training contracts in law firms that do what they want to do and and that's really important for them to be targeted because I go back to what I said originally. Student, if you know what you like doing, you should do well at it. If that is what you want to do, that you like to do. But ultimately, then the advice would be 
well, speak to your training principal before you even start. Just say, look, I have four seats here, because that's usually how many. Some do six, but usually four seats. I just want to ensure that of those four, one of them is this seat. And I can't imagine that there are many organisations who won't say, out of four, we'll make sure you get one of those. And I know that we will try to get um, at least two or even three of the choices that the trainees des- you know, really want and identify from the beginning. It's difficult to get all of them. Sometimes it just doesn't work that well, um, depending on what's going on at the time. But yeah, make it very clear from the very beginning, because I, I get that. But it may not be the end, as you say, at all. You may find yourself... And I, th- I think there's many trainees who do that. Many trainees who think they're going into law, thinking they're going to do something else. And they're just their experience in one part of the firm is sif- totally different to what they expected. And in fact, I've definitely seen the way around where, where people said that they were, oh, definitely, I'm going to be, a, whatever it happens to be, this is the lawyer I'm going to be. Um, and then they sit in that seat for six months and realise it's actually nothing what they thought. Absolutely nothing what they thought at all. And... Um, deeply disappointed by that so you just never know thank you well thank you so much simon for joining us today on the student lawyer podcast you've given us such a great insight into the life of a commercial property lawyer um, and hopefully the listeners will have a much clearer idea of what to expect if they do wish to pursue a career in real estate um so yeah thank you so much for coming on the show as a guest absolutely no problem delighted and um do it again thank you and thank you to all of the listeners as well for tuning in and we will see you in the next one goodbye to hear more of the student lawyers podcast hit the subscribe button and leave us a star rating and review If you would like to join The Student Lawyer as a writer, please email hello at thestudentlawyer.com.